Hey there, makers. So today we're going to go over how to print the There was Sam. He's just so excited. Um, so we're just going to go over a little bit of the process. I want to let you know that this is a long video, just like this is a long process. The video lasts about 12 minutes. Um, so just saying, one print, 12 minutes, lots of work. Um, kitchen lithography instructions. So you're going to find out how artists use the resistance of grease and water to create lithographs. So we're just going over the process. We're doing a bit of a different version as you're doing it at home, but it follows the same principles. The majority of mass printing is produced by lithographic process. It has the remarkable ability to reproduce all the subtle qualities of charcoal, pencil, ink, watercolor, and more. In this case, since we're at home, we're using that oil-based litho crayon. Um, this initiates characteristics, this innate characteristic is why so many artists over the years have chosen to work in litho. Um, so we're going to go ahead now um, and go down to the materials part of this and walk you through the process. So materials that you're going to need, you're going to need foil paper towels, vegetable oil, oil-based lithography ink, again oil-based. Uh, lithography ink that's very specific, sponges, brayers, uh, paper towels, a wooden spoon or doorknob uh, for printing at home, mental ruler with a cork bottom, we highly recommend, scissors, uh, paper, we recommend student grade, you know, printing paper, um, just to keep it cheap um, and, and make sure that you're not killing your budget here. Um, as you can see, we have taken many like cleaning precautions as far as this video is concerned in this process. We are both wearing gloves and we have been sure to create a really clean area to work on. Um, you don't want all these additional contaminants because it's an oil-based um, water process. You don't want to bring any extraneous materials in onto the plate. Uh, as Brett said, you can see us cleaning with the oil here as we're trying to rub out our image. I'm trying to make sure that we leave that oil on the plate and every cleaning, we're using a new piece of paper towel just to clean the ink and the material off the plate. And so that that oily material doesn't reactivate on the plate itself. You have to be very sensitive to all the variables that can possibly uh, be used here to mess up your image. It's not super difficult, but you have to keep kind of trying and practicing to see what works right. Um, and we would recommend that you uh, pay very close attention to how you're cleaning and what you're doing here. Um, after you have wiped out your image um, using the oil, uh, you can go on and clean it with water. We were very uh, light with how we spritzed the, the image area itself. Hey Sam, is there any way we could back the video up just a little bit to where we took it out of the um, Coke? I just wanna make sure that we show them that we dried the plate first before going into the oiling off process. Roger that, going back. So quick rewind here as we're like backing it up. Um, we just wanna be sure to be really specific in giving you these instructions as Sam and I spent a lot of trial and error time going back and forth. Um, there's many times this didn't work for us, so we wanna just be sure that give you very specific instructions and things to follow. As you know, um, we also will provide the written instructions for you as well. Um, so here we are at this point, we've then taken the aluminum foil out of our etch um, and we're cleaning it. The first thing you're gonna do is spritz some water on it and dampen it down using your palms of your hand and a paper towel. Just to note, that's a new paper towel every time. We've said it many times, you just don't want to cross-contaminate in this process at risk of losing your image, et cetera. Um, and you do not want to scrub as you're laying these paper towels down on top because you don't want to risk moving your drawing deposits somewhere else because um, that'll scum or mark your image in a way that you don't really want. And you're going to keep repeating this until you think your plate is completely dry. Um, and we recommend that you discard any paper towels you've used as you use them um, and you're not recontaminating over and again. Is that a new sheet of, that I, did I dry it with last time? Throw it out so that you can make, guarantee 
controlled space and service and area, and then you're not possibly bringing in recontaminants um, through your cleaning process or through your um, image construction process. So after applying your vegetable corn oil uh, directly to the plate, begin wiping out the image using a paper towel in a circular motion. The image will dissolve or disappear. Don't worry, it'll come back. Give it some time and space, and you're gonna see how that happens here in a few moments. Um, so using a new paper towel, continue to wipe away the surface till the image is completely gone and the entire surface area has a thin oil coating. You should still be able to see the ghost of the image just barely. All right, and as you'll see in a few moments here, uh, Brett's gonna come in with a um, water bottle and he's just gonna very lightly, sparingly spritz down that surface of that, um, of that, that, that tin foil. So just to kind of note, as this is a little bit different than the normal process, we're using clean water every single time. So instead of having buckets and sponges, we're using the spritzer and a clean natural sponge, uh, making sure that it doesn't already have some predetermined cleaning agents in it. We made that mistake as well, um, and it was just wiping off our image. So be sure that you can try to find some sort of natural sponge, et cetera. Um, so you want to also try when we're doing this process, you're going to spritz and sponge and spritz and sponge um, that you're trying to keep the sponge on the surface of the aluminum foil. We have cleaned the table, but once again, don't want to bring in any extraneous things that we might have just wiped off or that still exists on the table underneath. So that, that cellulose sponge, that's 100% cellulose sponge that Brett, that Brett just mentioned. Um, if you use a regular sponge, oftentimes there are antibiotic packets, which are great for cleaning. If you're cleaning surfaces and cleaning around your house, awesome. But it's a very different kind of process here. That antibiotic soapy material <clears throat> can add oil back into the image. So being careful that you're using a cellulose sponge and that that contaminant, and we say this from experience, doesn't come into the process itself. So we eliminated the possibility of those oils from the from the non-cellulose sponges uh, coming in by making sure we got 100% cellulose sponges. And these are from the grocery store. We found them at um, here in the Midwest in Cub Foods. Um, so I know you can find them there. Um, you just gotta make sure you keep your eyes out and you're gonna ask your local, local grocery store person, hey, do you have any cellulose sponges? They're gonna know that item, it's a stock item. Um, and often people request it. So um, just make sure that you ask for cellulose sponges, 100% cellulose sponges, no sponge packets in the center. And you can slice your, um, with a razor blade, slice your, sp your sponge open and check for them. If it has it in there, cool. Now you've got two sponges, top half, bottom half. Just um, you know, shave down the sponge to make sure you've got two halves there and then pull out the packet, get rid of it. Once that packet's gone, the problem's gone. Um, but 100% cellulose sponges, like Brett said, control for the variables. This was something that we really had to work on as we went through uh, this process over and over again. So you, as you're gonna see, Sam's gonna use his roller to quickly go over the image. Um, we didn't ever, we did about one to three passes each time. It's gonna take time for your image to build up and you're gonna want to alternate back and forth. So as Sam is adding ink with the roller, I am spritzing in between, making sure that that piece of aluminum tin foil is staying moist and damp while Sam recharges that roller and then wiping that water away, making sure to do it evenly across the surface each time. Um, be sure to keep the image damp um, and, and run the sponge over the image until you're ready to apply ink with the roller. Um, Brett and I are often referring to the normal lithographic process that's done on stones. We did this as a team. We recommend you can do that, but it's very possible to do this on your own. Sponge in one hand, uh, and you can spritz it with, with the same hand that's holding your sponge, and then rolling, with, rolling up with the other hand. Um, you could also just put your sponge down, grab the roller with the other hand, go back and forth. Um, but we recommend that you know you do this as a team process with a partner or a friend, and you just get somebody to sponge for you. It's not a very difficult thing to do the sponging. Um, so that's a really great way to make this a community process. If you're alone and by yourself, like I just said, you can do this on your own. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add that when you're doing the sponging, you're not 
applying a ton of pressure. You're not trying to wipe that image away. Um, one, in this process, you risk bending and like crinkling the tin foil, but also you don't want to move that ink that's being deposited on top of the images around or wipe it away. It's just a process of keeping it moist and then drying it off and keeping it moist and drying it off. Um, and that alternation between Sam and I. So making sure that ink isn't drying onto the plate, um, but still keeps, um, and also making sure that water coats the areas where the ink is not supposed to be. Um, so that ink stays in the specific area so there isn't any smudging or scumming as you go along. Um, and like I said before, this is gonna take time. Um, as you're watching it in real time, we're going back and forth. The first inking up always takes the longest to get that image to come back. Um, like Brett's saying, you're keeping that sponge only on the surface area um, where you're cleaning it. Um, I would recommend that, you know, between uses that you keep it in your hand, that it's just going over that tinfoil area, just over that tinfoil area. Again, control for your variables. Um, your, sprint, your sponge being clean or a new sponge doesn't matter so much, but just making sure that as you're working, it's only in that one space. Again, control for the variables. You, you can see that um, the inking is going diagonal, it's going vertical, it's going horizontal, so that you're putting ink in different areas over the image so that wherever that drawn image is, and how it picks up being really important. Um, and that you can see that we are removing our gloves here as we prepare for the printing process. We think the image looks like it's rolled up and it's good and strong. Um, We're gonna go so ahead and place that paper. Um, we have it pre-cut, that's super important. Pre-cut your paper so you're not trying to run around and do it all because your ink has a possibility of drying and the process won't work. Um, but as Sam said, you remove your gloves before the printing step to avoid any contaminants again. You're going to place your paper over the image. Our paper was smaller than the tin foil, which is a good way to go. Um, then you're going to place down your paper towel. And then on top of that paper towel, you're going to put a bag or a plastic bag or a page protector of some kind, sandwich bag. Um, and then using a wooden spoon, you'll start applying pressure to that image. Um, once again, this is quite untraditional to start printing by hand, um, lithographs with a wooden spoon, um, but you're going to use the wooden spoon in similar to all the other processes in a systematic way in small rotations. On top of that plastic bag, you're going to go vertical and horizontal, ensuring that you're transferring that entire image. So uh, again, it's small rotations with the spoon and you're going small rotations vertically across your image area, and then you're gonna do those small rotations, like little loop-de-loops across horizontally, and then diagonally, and diagonally the other way. Make sure you do a little around the edges of the, um, the four corners of your piece of paper, and then do a nice X to make sure that you're getting that, that image area. Um, and this follows the traditional method of uh, how um, scraping would happen with a, when you're trying to clean the stone, but we're doing that to try to get the, the best image possible. Um, as you can see here, this came out a little gray. So we go back and we try to print again, um, but you can see that it has a lot of great qualities despite being a bit gray. Um, so we, we go back in and try to print again. Again, this is a process that requires a lot of proofing and trying and working through. We wanted to show that, you know, errors do happen and that it's important to stick with it and keep going. Um, you, theoretically, you could pull 30 to 40 prints um, with, with one lithographic image. Um, we didn't get up quite that high. Uh, I think we did three one evening um, and that's about as far as we went. And no doubt, Brett and I got very frustrated using this process, but uh, it also pushed us and made us grow a lot as printmakers and as image makers. Uh, and we were like super happy when we figured this out. Uh, lithogra lithography has lots of possibilities. And we are fully in love with this process. We're very excited by the idea of making images here. Again, we used oil-based gambling ink. Um, that's very unusual for Brett and I, but outside of using an oil-based ink, everything else was very, uh, was very green uh, in this process. You know, you're using kitchen oil, we're using water, cellulose sponges, um, and, and Brett and I are really controlling the process. We did clean up with a little bit of solvents here to get that, that oil-based ink on, 
But again, we cleaned up in a very, um, we took our plexiglass, which is where we were inking on top of, took it outdoors to a, a very ventilated area. And that's how we cleaned up with paper towels and gloves, our, our inked area. Um, and basically we're making sure to take very good care of ourselves, each other, the space around us um, as we did this. But um, this is a really great, a lot of and we are continued to be excited about it. It brings a lot of possibilities to printmaking at home. Um, you know, being able to do litho on tinfoil, you know, I never would have imagined that. Um, we highly recommend this. It's super exciting. We're printing this by hand. You could run this through a press if you have a home-based press. Um, and it provides a lot of possibilities. The one thing I'll say is I'll piggyback on Sam is that this, for both of us, when we got it, it just the expanse of accessibility now, like the idea of being able to print a lithograph at home, um, when it's been very exclusive to like print studios, et cetera, or people who have and can afford presses. So I just think it really expands that um, accessibility to the process. The one thing I wanna note, um, as you could see before we transitioned into speaking a little bit about the process, if you are going to edition or your image shows up gray or et cetera, right? Um, you're going to want to, the moment you take that image off, re-wet that piece of tin foil um, and get, just keep sponging. Have somebody, either you do it or somebody else, as you prepare to do it again. Um, that's also why we say always pre-prepare the paper, because if you are going to addition, you want to hop right into the next one. Um, if you don't have things prepared, um, you run the risk of it either scumming or taking up additional marks or the plate drying out. Um, and taking ink where you don't exactly want it to. As we move through the process, it's tin foil, so it is going to degrade a little bit as you go along. Um, so just trying to be really aware and specific with these first few prints, and maybe when you start keeping the addition slightly smaller, um, if you do want to addition and to continue to work through the process. Um, I just want to say that this was great for Sam and I. I think it kept us both on our toes as people who have printed Litho and studios and work with many different processes um, just to try to figure out all the different things to overcome to get this process to work. Um, and as we always say, if you have any questions, we're more than here to help you along the way and answer them and help you problem solve as we helped each other throughout this process as well. Again, if you don't have our personal emails, you're only seeing this on YouTube, please feel free to reach out to us on poststudioprintmaking at gmail.com. Again, that's poststudioprintmaking at gmail.com. Uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions. As you can see, this is a lot darker. You can see a little more scumming there. Um, we are happy that it got black blacks. That was really what we were trying to get at with this test print. Um, but, uh, you know, scumming is definitely a problem. You can rub the scumming out with a little piece of uh, sponge or you could use a piece of paper towel to kind of like friction rub it out. Um, you could try to roll it out with your roller. Again, you have to kind of do like a quick roll over your, your image area as a possible way to clean up that scumming. Um, but you have to, again, keep it wet, as Brett said, between each, just a tiny little spritz of water and, uh, and a little bit of rubbing. Um, also, you can prevent, um, prevent scumming with, you know, a little more Coke. Put coke on a piece of a uh, piece of um, a Q-tip. Dip a Q-tip in there and use the coke over it. So it's like a re-etching it with acid um, in traditional lithography uh, in order to etch out that area that's picking up ink. Um, so you know you're trying to really stabilize your image as much as you can over your edition. Um, and how do you get that to happen? Um, Again, this is not something that's usually taught in a week-long class, but uh, over the course of a semester, you learn tricks and tools in order to get a great print um, or, and over time. So if you're seeing this for the first time, we recommend lots of practice to try to really get uh, your series or a group of prints together. This is a great way to make images for a zine. This is a great way to make images, uh, reproducible images that look great and are very high quality um, without the need of a press. Um, being able to print this by home, at home without a press by hand is very possible. You could also do multicolor lithographs in this way. Um, 
We are very happy with what's been happening with this. And we suggest that uh, you practice, 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 practice. Um, this really requires that you dive in and do some experimentation um, and play with this. Um, you might need to get a couple different kinds of Coke, a couple different kinds of tin foil. Um, really the only highly specific materials that we used here were one, the printmaking ink, and two, the lithographic crayons. Um, there are other oil-based materials that you could use for possible drawing. Uh, we experimented with a bunch of them, but this is really what we found what worked best for us was lithographic crayons and with, uh, and with the um, oil-based inks. Uh, um, and and we, we recommend that you really stick with those two. That's what we found had to be uh, the traditional materials that worked best for us. But, um, you know, let us know if you experiment and you find other stuff out. We're very open to learning and finding out new things. Um, and we hope you are too. Please continue to share with us. We'd love to hear what, what people are doing. Bye. Take care, printmakers.